Welcome everybody to our workshop semester around the authority of the believer. You are in session number one. So excited about this topic. I believe that it, as it connects with the topic of redemption and then on the other side, the topic of the Holy Spirit, I believe it becomes the lens for which you interpret most everything about human suffering, about God himself, and about you yourself. So this is an extraordinary time. I welcome you. I want to encourage you to look at the workshop show notes on our website so that you can stay up and, and keep pace with us. Today we're going to launch with this question. The big idea is answering, does God use human agency to fulfill his purposes or does God arbitrarily dictate outcomes via his sovereign determination? Now, that's a bunch of big words, so let me, uh, let me hit it again. First, does God use human agency to fulfill his purposes? In other words, does God move independent of human agency or people to administer the things that God wants to do in the earth? Does God do that independent of human agency or does God use human agency? And that leads us to that next question. Does God arbitrarily dictate the outcomes via his sovereign determination? So everything that would happen in the world under that umbrella would, would be because God ordained it, because God determined it, because God wanted it to happen. Well, today we are going to look at those particular questions. And as we look at this concept of sovereignty, sovereignty, it's a big word. It's a word that people today don't use a lot in everyday conversations. It's not like you sit down at Starbucks and be like, hey, what you heard about sovereignty? Well, you've got to understand sovereignty to really understand who God is, how he works. Now, as we begin to delve into this, I want you to know that depending on how you have profiled God, depending on how you believe his interaction with humanity is, and particularly as individuals, how that relationship with God should be formed. As you think of God, who he is, how he works, how he acts, the things that quote unquote trigger him, the things that cause him to come alive or to be pleasured or actually to be angered. However, you, you view all of those pieces is going to have a lot to do with how you now are emotionally going to process what we're going to talk about today and throughout this entire workshop. Because there are going to be people, and it could be you, who at times are going to think, we are doing a personality makeover of God. And here's what I want you to know. A lot of Christians need their profile of God's personality to have a makeover. They absolutely need that. I want you to know that as we talk about this, if you hit any emotional disruption, just take a deep breath and keep moving forward, expecting the Word of God to bring clarity. We're not interested in just having some kind of bias that we're looking towards to say, now we're going to control an outcome. We're going to control what's going to happen next. What we want to do is say, God, what is in your Word? And from the Word of God, establish our beliefs around spiritual authority. Because spiritual authority is, do you as a believer, do you have the capacity to represent God in this earth with power and authority to establish his will in the earth? Or do we just simply pray and let God figure it all out and our desire is to humble before a sovereign God and just let him do what he does. When we talk about the word sovereign or sovereignty, we're simply saying that God in his attributes that God is sovereign, meaning that God can do whatever he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and he is accountable to no one. God doesn't have to give any kind of an account of any of his movement, any of his actions to anybody at any time. That actually God is accountable to himself, to his own being, to his own justice, to his own love, to who he is as a being. So with that being said, that God can do whatever he wants, how he wants, when he wants, there are a, a plethora of spinoffs that contradict each other in how we interact with this sovereignty. Uh, give you an example. If God is sovereign, does that mean that God can just do whatever he wants, when he wants? And even if he's in violation 
of redemption or his covenant with us, that if we read in the Bible that God said something about us, can God, even though he has said something in his sovereignty, do whatever he wants? Can he jump above all of his previously spoken word and do what he sovereignly, arbitrarily decides in a moment? Or can God be sovereign and in his sovereignty have given us the promise, the word, redemption? Can he, in his sovereignty, decided what he wanted to do? And now then today, the sovereignty of God is revealed to us through his word. This is what he wants to do with maybe the caveat that in his positive sovereignty, he at times can find cracks in the spiritual law or cracks in the system to where he could move in and begin to bless us with things that we do not deserve, that we did not engage, that we did not uh, necessarily put ourselves in reception of? Those are good questions. And how you frame that up is going to have a lot to do with the kind of intimacy or how you're going to have to navigate certain challenges in your life. So as we ask this question again, and I want to revisit it, the question we're answering is, does God use human agency to fulfill his purposes, or does God arbitrarily dictate outcomes via his sovereign determination? How, how does it work? I want to use this illustration that will kind of put more color commentary in it. If you have a 15-year-old uh, daughter, and just imagine with me, your 15-year-old daughter comes to you and shares with you that there are warts all over your child's body. You, warts on the feet, warts on the hands, warts, you know, around their body. Even maybe a, a wart or two in their facial complexion. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Your, your mom, your dad, what are you going to do? How are you spiritually going to respond to your 15-year-old daughter who's just told you that there are, you know, 15-plus warts all over her body? Are, are you going to, number one, are you, number one, simply going to ask God to do a miracle. Are you going to come before God and say, God, I'm asking you to do a miracle. Now let me, let me kind of squeeze this further down. The attitude that you come asking this miracle is going to be distinct. Are you going to use the attitude of, of God, I'm asking you to do a miracle, but it's not anything that's based in my responsibility. I don't have any authority. I don't have any endowment. There isn't any kind of power. There isn't anything uh, in my human agency that can even address a wart on a body. And so, God, I'm just simply kind of throwing up a prayer to you, asking you to do the miracle. And so if the miracle doesn't happen, then I can immediately defer off that, God, you didn't want it to happen. Because if you wanted it to happen, your God, quote unquote, your sovereign, now we're, we're talking about the arbitrary version, your arbitrary in your sovereignty dictating predetermined outcomes. And so God, if it doesn't happen, it must not be your will. Is that, is that the approach? God, I'm asking you to do a miracle. I'm asking you to heal my daughter from these warts. But God, it's completely up to you. I have no responsibility. This prayer is not, is not me asking you, God, uh, because I, with spiritual authority in this earth, legally am operating in alignment with spiritual law. And I am now then inviting the God of the universe to do what he wants to do. And I am establishing his will through prayer on earth as it is in heaven. So is my prayer inviting God in with spiritual authority into the earth and understand God would be the one that gave us the authority and there's reasoning behind why we would invite a God who created the universe into this world to do a miracle even though he already wanted to do it as though he wouldn't be able to do it unless we invited him. Is this an issue of I'm inviting God, I'm operating in this authority of the believer, in this authority in this earth. Now again, this right out of the gate is creating conflict for some people. I don't know if it's true of you or anybody who is watching this together with you. But I can tell you across Christianity, this is an exact moment 
of conflict. Because people now then are thinking, so are you saying that the Christian might have the ability to ask God to do something that now he, humanity, man, human agency is giving God the license to move in the earth? Well, just hold on, hold on, keep your seatbelt on, don't let go, don't keep a grip, because there's some, some mileage we got to go down, there's a scenic route we're going to take, there's, there's some things that you have to understand. Never, ever are we ever in a peer relationship with God where authority is concerned, and never are we over God. We are submitted to God, we are under God, all authority comes from God, we're simply receiving the authority that he's already given us. But when we pray, we've got to ask this question, when we pray and ask God for a miracle, are we doing one of two things? Are we saying, God, we're asking you to move in, in your sovereignty, do whatever you want to do. And if you do it, it's your will. And you don't, it's not your will. I have no responsibility in this at all. The only reason I'm praying is because I want to nurture my humility, my humility before a sovereignly determined God. Or secondly, am I operating in this sense of, God, you've given me spiritual authority, the authority of the believer, and when I pray, I'm praying for the miracle because I believe that you have endowed me in this earth to represent you in the earth, and when I pray, I am executing spiritual law, and I am receiving what your grace has given me to establish your kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, how you answer that has prolific, prolific outcomes, prolific uh, kinds of, of uh, understandings of God in life. How you answer that's going to have a lot to do with how you attach to God. In our redemption workshop, we talked about the insecure and secure attachment styles that neurobiologically we attach with caretakers like our mom or dad or even siblings in our home, we attach to our primary caretakers. And when our brains feel nurtured, when we interpret nurture, we become bonded to those who are around us. When we're insecure, we're not sure what's going to happen. We don't know that when we have a need for nurture, for support, for help, that we're going to get it, then we respond with anxiety or avoidance or even confusion and chaos. When it comes to our relationship with God, you're going to experience God in your humanity in the final dimension, the final level will be with your brain. Your brain is what is interpreting if in finality. Your brain is determining what your experience with God was about. And this brings us right back to the neural pathways of attachment. So when we talk about when you pray for your 15-year-old daughter to be healed of 15 words, why are you praying? Are you praying to get God just submit to whatever his plan and purpose is as though you don't know it, as though there is no revelation, there is no covenant, there is no redemption, there is no word? Or if there is, God in his sovereignty always has the license to transcend it or to disavow it or to somehow ignore those things because he's God? Or do you look at spiritual authority as though that God in his sovereignty gave you through redemption the ability to stand as his ambassador and you pray, but the prayer is simply engaging spiritual law. And then you move away from asking God to do something and you begin to stand in his stead and you begin to declare in the name of Jesus, warts, I command you to die. I command you to wither at the root. I command you to leave any virus that is behind this war. I command you to leave this body and you continue to contend, fight the good fight of faith, not back down, not back up. And you never question the will of God because you are unsure of how the sovereignty of God works with you. You are secure that God's sovereign word, his word, the Bible, redemption, the covenant, those things are established forever. And because they are, you ain't backing up. You're going to stand, go eyeball to eyeball, and you're going to speak to your mountain and believe that it will be removed. So which way will you go? How will you answer such things? You see, in your Christian walk, how you answer this has so much to do with the kind of God, the kind of God that you want to walk with and talk with and, and how you're going to have freedom of intimacy. 
Quite honestly, if you're choosing the first uh, style, the first approach, that God's sovereignty transcends redemption, his word, and so on, if that's how you're going to approach this, I promise you, you have had some struggles with attachment towards God. Because you're trying to figure out, how do I get close to a God who sometimes wants me to endure human suffering? No matter what your purpose is. Because some people will say, well, when you endure human suffering, God's got a purpose. He's teaching you. He's disciplining you. You go right down the line. And I answer those things in the redemption workshop. But here's the deal. If you think like that, you're always going to be looking out for yourself. At some degree, at some degree, you're going to have insecurity of what's God doing here? And let me just be a little smart aleck here just for a second. If you really believe that God puts you in human suffering, why are you looking for an escape out of it? In the natural. If you really believe that God could be putting you in or leaving you in or allowing you to be in human suffering, let's say sickness and disease, why is it you take medicine and why is it you go to the doctor? See, what you're doing is living in a conflict. You are contradicting yourself. And in cognitive, uh, cognitive dissonance where you believe one thing and you act another, you are a confused human being. And so what we want to do is say to you, look at how your approach to God, how you profiled his personality. And it doesn't matter if grandma believed it. It doesn't matter if your mama believed it. It doesn't matter if this is the way your church believed it. Now, if you believe different than an organization, a group, some kind of social network, if you believe it different now than they do, maybe you won't be uh, celebrated like you have been before. Listen, there comes a point where we got to strip all that stuff off and we just got to ask the question, how are we going to authentically interact with this God who sent his son to die for us, who sent his son to redeem us, who sent his son to raise us up to seat together with him in heavenly places. You're going to have to decide, am I going to stick with the objective word of God or am I going to move into some kind of bias? I'm going to live through a lens that's already determining my outcomes of interpretation based on what I want that outcome to be. And often when people are in social work, social groups, they end up moving towards that which keeps them in the positive social network rather than abiding in what is actually true, what is real, what is objective. So today, these are big questions. How are you going to respond? This is, again, the question, does God use, partner with human agency to fulfill his purposes? I just, I, I just want to, again... Ask the question, does God use or partner with human agency to fulfill his purposes? Or does God arbitrarily dictate outcomes via his sovereign determination? I got some more questions for you to consider. You know, when you pray, do your prayers have a direct impact on the outcomes of what happens in the world? Or are your prayers just deferring to the predetermined will of God? So this is prayer. We're talking prayer now. Just simple prayer, similar to what we talked about with your 15-year-old daughter who might have had 15 or more warts. Prayer. So I'm asking it again. Does prayer have direct outcomes? Direct outcomes. When you pray, direct outcomes on your circumstances. Or is your prayer simply a deferring, a submission, a surrender to what God's sovereign predetermined will is? And just, I'll accept whatever, God, whatever you do in my experience that I will accept as your will. When it comes to evangelism, does our evangelism, does your evangelism, reaching your neighbors, reaching people in your workplace, when you share your faith in Christ, does evangelism and what you do with it have a direct impact on the salvation of a sinner's heart. Think about that. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. I'm asking you, evangelism, does it have a direct impact, a direct impact on a sinner's heart? Or, on the other hand, is it that God's already controlled the outcome of a person coming to faith that God's already determined who will be saved and who won't. And so your job is to share your faith just to submit in your relationship to God what he's commanding you to do to go out into all the world. Which one is it? Is it that God is actually partnering with you and your human agency to get his will done 
Or are we just kind of going through the motions because God's got it all figured out and all under control? Understand, these attitudes, these core beliefs, these emotions, these narratives that we have, have profound impacts upon how we live our lives. When it comes to things like miracle healing or what the Bible calls the laying on of hands. So there's a scripture that says, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. Let them lay hands on them in the name of the Lord and they will be healed. So here we go. Laying on of hands. So when a Christian, a believer, lays hands, it's just a touching of a person, lays hands on them. And first of all, why does God want us to do that? Is that merely a touch point of love? It's just like, hey, just compassion. I just want to touch you. There's nothing more to it. It's just human to human, peer to peer. It's just comfort. Is, is that why the Bible says that Jesus laid hands on multitudes? Or is that why we read in the book of Acts with the apostles and leaders of the first century church and they laid hands on people? Or when the Bible instructs us or Jesus instructed believers to lay hands on the sick in the Great Commission, that whoever believes will be saved, these signs will follow them to believe, they will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Is that just a point of saying, I love you, I'm here for you, I'm touching you? Or is there something of a, an authority nature, something of human agency and partnering with God where God works through the human body, the hands of another believer to bring about his will that it's, it's a transfer of power, a transfer of anointing. Which, which way is that? Which way is it? So when we talk about laying on of hands, is laying on of hands, when I lay hands on people, is that because it's going to create a direct impact? And am I supposed to believe that when I do it, when I, when I put my hands on somebody's shoulders or hold their hands, but I'm laying hands on them, when I put my hands on them, in obedience to scripture, am I supposed to have the attitude that I believe that they will have an outcome of healing because of the trigger, because of the catalyzing I have done by laying hands on them? Or do I lay hands on them and just expect that God in his sovereignty has already figured out where he's going to heal them or not, and I just am submitting to the command of God to lay hands on people? And this is about my virtue as a submitted person and the laying on of hands is just to love people. See, these are questions that a lot of Christians never think about. They just never think about it. And so you come to a workshop and I make you think about it. I make you think about it because what we are doing is flushing to the surface toxic beliefs, toxic ideas, toxic thinking around God. Because these are the kinds of thoughts and beliefs that hold people back from attachment and intimacy with God. You know, one of the things that Jesus said is that you would go in my name, go in my name, in my name. When Jesus gave us his name, the name of Jesus, is that something that we use, the name of Jesus? So, as an example, whenever we are declaring something, whenever we are commanding something, you read in the book of Acts some of the practical patterns of how they use the name. We have an occasion in uh, the first part of the book of Acts where there is a, a man lame, lame. Uh, he's uh, incapable of getting up and moving around. He sits at this gate of the city called the Gate Beautiful, and Peter and John come rolling in and they say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, first of all, I want you to notice that they use the name here, not in prayer, petitioning God, asking God to heal the man, but they are simply standing in the name of Jesus and expecting that whatever they speak with that name behind it is now then going to have an outcome. That that name, and later when they said these apostles, these disciples, they got special powers, they stood up and said, wait, wait, this isn't because we have special powers. It was faith in that name, faith in that name. 
So when we use the name of Jesus, whether it is in prayer, we can pray and say in Jesus' name, amen. But when we pray and use the name or we give a direct command and then we back it up with the name of Jesus, for which we see Jesus has instructed us to do, to use his name, the name that is above every name, the most excellent name ever given to a human, the name of Jesus. Whenever we use that name, are we supposed to use it and expect it to have a direct catalyzing impact on a person's experience, ours or somebody else's? Or, or are we supposed to use that name and it's kind of like just throwing up uh, numbers in a lottery? <laughs> it's like going to a convenience store and buying your lotto ticket. And you don't know, there's millions of different options. There's millions of people that could be buying those. And, but there is a hundred million purse that can be won if you just come up with the right numbers on your ticket, your lotto ticket. Some people pray that way. Some people use the name of Jesus and they're like, I'm going to command that thing to leave somebody. And if it works, then God in his sovereignty wanted it to work. And if it doesn't, then God didn't want it to work. So which one is it? Is it that God partners with human agency or is it that God's already determined to do it? We're just kind of going through the motions. We don't activate anything. We're just surrendering to the command of God to use the name of Jesus. When it comes to demons and devils, casting devils or demons out of people or simply resisting the devil, when we do that, when we take dominion and we say, in the name of Jesus, I command the demons and devils to cease in their operation, to stop what they're doing. Is that going to have a direct catalyzing impact? Does that activate anything? Does it create any difference in the actual outcome of life? Or is it just that demons are sitting there the whole time looking at God, looking at God, and they're like, I don't care about you. You're stupid. You're human. You ain't got nothing. You, you don't intimidate. But by the way, when you're using the name of Jesus or you're using quote unquote authority, it has no bearing on me. I get all of my marching orders from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that what demons do? And so when, when, when we use the name of Jesus or we speak to demons, is that where they now then only obey if God comes down and in that specific special moment, make them obey? See, these questions matter. This isn't just sitting around playing Pokemon Go. This isn't like tiddlywinks. This isn't just being goofy. This isn't just sitting around and saying, it doesn't really matter what you believe. You know, anything you believe, it, doesn't, it just doesn't matter. No, it, it might matter. In fact, I'll tell you, I believe it fully matters. It matters. It matters. And so we come before ourselves and ask, do we understand our responsibility. So when we talk about responsibility, in a corporate setting, if you work in any organization, you know that when you've been given responsibility for something, the only way for you to execute that responsibility if you, is if you've been given authority. Think about that. The only way to execute the responsibility that somebody gives you is if you have the authority to do what have you been given responsibility for. And if you've been given responsibility but not authority, it can't be accomplished, and vice versa. You cannot be given authority without now having responsibility. And responsibility means that you're not just filling a shadow role. You're not just a puppet. You're not just a robot. Now then, you are actually doing something in the game representing. You cannot have authority without responsibility, and you can't have responsibility without authority. Now, I just want to ask a, a funny uh, question. Have you ever, if you're a parent or a spouse, have you ever talked to a, a friend, whoever, you've talked with them, and there was a delegation of, in the conversation of who was going to do something. Like, you know, Tina and I, my wife, we've got two boys, and now they are in their, you know, 20s. But when, when they were younger and going to school, somebody had to pick them up. Somebody had to drop them up and pick them up. It wasn't the drop-off that was usually a concern. It was a pickup. Who's going to pick them up? And my wife's very structured. She's on top of everything. But I do remember there were occasions 
when she would get a hold of me by a text or something and say, hey, are you picking them up? And I remembered, oh, snap, I'm supposed to be the one that picks them up. Now, I want you to consider what it's like to have a responsibility that is unclear. Neither party knows who's supposed to take it. And so I'm expecting her to pick them up. She's expecting me to pick them up. And so often they don't get picked up, right? I want you to now think about anything that Jesus, the Bible, redemption, shares responsibility to us. There is a delegation of responsibility. At that point of responsibility, there is authority. And if that is not defined, and if I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and I don't have clarity around what my uh, role, my power, my ability to execute is, if I don't know that, then there's going to be something that's going to fail, something that is going to, quote, unquote, fall through those cracks, something that's not going to work. I think in the kingdom of God, I think with Jesus and our walk with him, so many Christians that I've witnessed, so many Christians, they don't know that it's their responsibility. And so they're waiting for God to pick up their kids. They're waiting for God to heal their body. They're waiting for God to prosper them. They're waiting for God to answer their prayer. They're waiting for God to give them favor. They're waiting for God to protect them. They're waiting for God. God's like, I am your protector. I have endowed you with the powers of heaven and earth. I have given you my very riches, the riches of my glory. I've given you my very highest and my greatest. I've given that to you. Now then, I've endowed you with a responsibility to pick up your kids. I've endowed you with a responsibility to speak to the mountains, to resist the devil. I've given you the authority. I've given you the responsibility. And when it looks like circumstantial, nothing's changed, then what you do is you continue to fight the good fight. You don't back up. You don't back down. You don't slow down. You stand on the word. You declare with authority what I've told you to declare. You speak to the sickness. You speak to the disease. You speak to your career. You speak to your home. You speak peace over your family. You declare that me and my house will serve the Lord. You establish God's will on the earth. It doesn't look like anything's changing. It doesn't matter if it looks like it's changing or not because God's Sovereignty is in his word. His word gave you authority. The authority gave you responsibility. You keep standing as the ambassador of Jesus and you declare what God has declared over you. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. If you don't know who's responsible, understand the kids won't get picked up. (laughs) The kids don't get picked up. So as we pursue spiritual authority, what it is, how it works. It is so important that we resolve these questions, these ideas of what is God's role? What is my role? How we answer this has huge implications. I'm going to read some scriptures. And in these scriptures, I want you to listen closely and again, follow along in your workshop show notes. And those scriptures that are there, read them and then begin to look for Who's responsible here? Who's responsible? Is it God, quote unquote, in his arbitrary sovereignty where he's dictating outcomes? Or is it our responsibility? As though God has given us the ability, the power, the wisdom, the resources to execute the responsibilities that he's given us. He's given us authority. So in John 14, 9, watch this. It says, what I, Jesus, am telling you, I do not say on my own authority. So Jesus is talking about authority. He says, I'm not telling you this on my own authority. But the Father who lives continually in me, he does the works, his own miracles, deeds of power. So I want you to notice what Jesus says. I've been walking this planet, and there's been multitudes that would come in, and I would heal them all. Heal them all. Jesus is working miracles left and right, whether it's turning water into wine, walking on water, breaking bread, multiplying it for the thousands of people around him. Jesus is doing miracles. And he says that the miracles I'm doing, I'm not doing by my authority. I'm doing by the authority of the Father who is in me. They are being worked from and through him as though that authority now is showing up in me, in my human agency to execute the plan of God in the earth. Verse 11. 
If you cannot trust me, at least let these works that I do in my Father's name convince you. Now, he says, I'm doing the works, these uh, powerful miracle works. I'm doing those in the Father's name. What's the Father's name mean? The word name is a representation of authority. That anytime you're doing something in somebody else's name, you're doing it in their authority, in their given responsibility, their delegated responsibility. And when they delegated the responsibility, they gave the authority to execute on it. So he says, I'm doing these works in the Father's name. I'm doing them in the authority that he has given me. And then in verse 12, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he himself will be able to do the things that I do. Now watch this. Jesus says, the miracles I'm doing, and nobody would question the miracles Jesus is doing. When Jesus is doing the miracles, he says, I'm doing them in the Father's name. And then Jesus moves to, if anyone. Anyone? If anyone, anyone who steadfastly believes in me, he himself will be able to do the things that I do. So what Jesus is saying is, is that the same authority that's working in me, that God is partnering, God the Father is partnering with me in my human agency. Jesus operating in the earth, though he's God, he's operating in the earth as a human so that he could be the ultimate sacrifice for all humans. That when Jesus is doing it, he's doing it in the Father's name. Then he takes that one step further and he gives it to anyone who steadfastly believes that they'll do and be able to do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father and I will do, I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am. Think about that. When you think about that verse, where does your interpretation fall? Does it fall in that God is now then sovereignly dictating this whole deal? He's already determined outcomes. And really what you're saying and doing doesn't matter because God's already decided, predetermined what's going to happen. Or is it that God is saying to us through Jesus and Jesus is speaking and he's saying that the Father's given me authority, I'm giving it to you. And now then, when you step into and activate that authority in your life, you're going to have the outcome that I have and even greater outcomes. Which way are you going to fall? Is it that God uses human agency? God uses human agency? Or is it that God has, doesn't care about human agency? He just wants you to submit to the commands that he gives. How about this one? Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So I want you to see Jesus begins this with all authority has been given to me, and then he says go. Sounds similar to what he said in John, doesn't it? That if you believe on me, I'm doing all this by the, Jesus said, I'm doing all this by the authority of the Father's name. I'm doing it in his responsibility that's been delegated to me. And that authority has caused these miracles to happen. And then Jesus says, anyone who believes on me, they're going to do the same works and even greater works. Now, Jesus in Matthew 28 says, all authority has been given me. All authority has been given me. And then he, and then he says, go. <laughs> Why does he put those two together? All authority has been given to me. Go. Sounds similar. That the authority that he had been given now then is being delegated to a, another generation. And this generation down is the believer. And he says that all authority has been given to me. Now you go with that authority also. And then he tells them that you will go and you will baptize people, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the name, the name authority, the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you'll teach them the things I've commanded you. And then I love this. Jesus says, I will be with you always. In other words, all of this authority that I'm giving you, that the authority that's been given to me, I'm now then telling you to go. Go means responsibility. Responsibility means authority. That when you go with this responsibility and authority, I'm going with you. Why is he going with you? Because he's going to confirm the word of God 
with signs following. He's going to confirm the authority. He's not just telling you to go and you have this kind of quasi placebo effect of authority. This is the very authority of God himself. And Jesus says, you say it, I'm going to back it up. You say it, I'm going to do it. You say it and I'll be there making it good. Well, that was Matthew 28. Now then, I want you to see Mark. So this is Mark's uh, writing of the same moment, same uh, season, same uh, text of what we just read in Matthew 28. So Mark 16, he says in verse 15, Jesus said to them, go, go. So if you just for a moment push pause and you take Matthew 28 and Mark 16, what you would know is right before he says go, he says all authority has been given me and then go. All authority has been given me, you go. He's given responsibility. So watch this. Jesus said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved and he who does not believe will be condemned. These signs or Miracles, the word signs here in the Greek is translated as miracles 23 times. These miracles will follow those who believe. So the question, who do they follow? Do they follow those who believe or do they follow God's sovereign action? Just take a breath, take a breath. You're okay. Inhale. Yes, that's it. So he says these signs will follow them that believe. If they follow them that believe, then it seems to me it's pretty straightforward that the authority and responsibility given to a Christian actually catalyzes outcomes. That God intends, in his sovereignty, God intends that the covenant redemption and the word of God would be in the responsibility of a believer, that believer then would activate it and then God would back it up. And these signs, these miracles would follow them that believe. And then he says, in my name, that's authority, in my name, authority, they will cast out demons, they'll speak with new tongues, they'll take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And then verse 20, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Now understand when it says the Lord working with them, this is after he's resurrected. So he's not even here in bodily form. The Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he's left the planet, if you will, and it says that he went with them, working with them, confirming the word with accompanying miracles, signs. What, what we see is that Jesus has delegated the authority the Father has given him, that authority and responsibility to preach, to evangelize, to pray, to declare, to establish the will of God in this earth. That has been given to the Christian, to the believer. That responsibility is ours. The authority is ours. And then Jesus says, you do it and I'll back it up. You do it, and I'll go with you, and I will make the miracles happen. So why is it? Why is it that so many Christians, they might try this, and when it doesn't work, they pull out, they disconnect. Why is it? It's because Christians usually try to interpret everything about God's will from their physical circumstances. Now, I just for a minute want to appeal to your rationale. Does it make sense to you that you would interpret the will of God by virtue of circumstances that happen in a fallen world that is dominated by the God of this world, little g, Satan? Does that make sense to you? That you would let the circumstances of this fallen world to dictate to you or to be a revelation to you and to be your highest truth that what God wants in your life is what you're experiencing in the moment. I got to tell you, that's jacked up. That's just jacked up. No, that doesn't make sense at all. And yet if you press people, that's how they have interpreted the joy, the love, the pleasure of God in their life. And what that means then is they feel that God has abandoned them, that God has rejected them, that God is not aware of them. Just last night I was uh, watching a TV news, late night news uh, piece, and it was talking about a 21-year-old man who 
got mad at God. He said that the reason he threw a rock through the front door of a church door in their glass window and then went in and began to rob it and pillage it and create problems, vandalism. He said, I did that because I was mad at God. I just suggest to you, if you're mad at God, it's because you have a jacked up interpretation of God. Because in fact, God is not responsible for all the circumstances that are happening in your life. Again, everybody take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath because I know anxiety and this confusion around, well, I thought God was this and I thought God was that. And you have created a profile that's framed God up and you for all your life. And now you're being presented with ideas that you may be thinking, oh, my gosh, do I know anything now? Do I know anything? I, I just my heart empathizes with you. It does. But you're going to be stuck if you don't move forward with what is objective, with what is the word, with what is truth. In Luke chapter 10, watch this. Luke chapter 10 and in verse 18. And Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power. I give you power. Now, this is a word power that's from the Greek word exousia, and it's generally translated as authority. And that's actually what it means, authority. Authority is, again, where we take a responsibility and then we have the endowment of power to be able to execute on that authority. We're going to talk just a little bit later about what authority really is and define it. But he says, I give you authority. I give you the authority. Well, if you've given me authority, then that would mean that you're not intending to execute the authority yourself. If my wife says, I'm giving you responsibility, therefore authority to pick up the kids from school, then what that means to me, it should mean to me that Tina is saying, I ain't picking the kids up today. And so I'm telling you, you do it. So if God is telling us, if Jesus is telling us, I gave you authority, you have authority. If he's telling you, you have authority, what that would mean then is Jesus saying, I'm not intending using my authority to directly activate outcomes. And so if you don't pick up the kids, they're not going to get picked up. Or in this case, if you don't use the authority, it's going to matter. He says, because I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. This is the power word for dunamis. It's where we get the kind of miracle uh, outcomes that you think of. It has to do with what would be the movement of energy. This is a literal word power. He says, I have given you this authority over all the serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will by any means hurt you. And then he says, don't rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Question, when you read that verse, do you come away thinking, Oh, I see how it works. The way it works is that I just ask God to do something and it has no bearing on an outcome. It's just I'm waiting for God to, you know, do whatever he does. Or do I read that verse and say, wait a minute. If he's given me authority, he's given me responsibility. And if I don't pick up the kids, the kids aren't getting picked up. Because he has no intent of actually activating it directly. That God wants to partner with us. That God intends that we be the executors of his authority in the earth. We be his representatives. When I read that uh, whole text and he says again, I give you power. And then he says that the spirits are subject to you. Notice it didn't say the spirits are subject to God. Now certainly the only reason they're subject to us is because of God. God gave us the authority. It's his power. It's his resource that backs it up. But I want you to notice on a direct level that the spirits are not subject to God or they're not subject to Jesus. They are subject to you. Now, again, the only way that works is if God and Jesus and the authority and power that they have has been delegated to us in a clear and pure form. But again, the enemy is actually aware you carry the authority. So if you don't use the authority, you don't take the responsibility, you don't activate it, it's not going to bring results. And even when you activate it and you don't see results, you can't lay down and quit. Your revelation is the word of God. Your revelation is redemption. How you have and live in uh, the highest truth is to live by the word. Live by what Jesus did for you. Because of that, when circumstances don't change, you ain't, you ain't moving. 
very much like a police officer. When a police officer is standing in front of some uh, crook, some robber, some thief, some whatever, some bad guy, <laughs> when the police officer stands there and says, stop in the name of the law, <laughs> stop, what if, what if that, that bad guy doesn't stop? What if, what if they just keep moving? Well, the officer doesn't say, well, I guess authority doesn't work. I guess the mayor and I guess the governor and I guess the president of the United States, I guess all the lines of authority, I guess if, if, if they wanted it to work, they would make it work. But because the, the enemy's not abiding, not responding, nah, I guess it doesn't work. No, what a police officer does is they rise up to another level of energy, another level of enforcement. And that level of enforcement then allows for there to be the authority now then known, the authority now then experienced. Well, that's the same thing in our spiritual lives. Whenever we take dominion and authority where God has given us that responsibility, where we take authority, if circumstances don't change, we don't back up, we don't quit, and we don't throw it off. That Well, if God wanted it to happen, he'd make it happen. And since it didn't happen, it must not be his will. No, we say, no, we know his will. We know his will, and nobody has ever changed the word of God. Nobody has changed the commission. Nobody's changed redemption. And because it hadn't been changed, when I speak this thing to the, I'm standing on, I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to believe on it. I'm going to stand. I'm going to do good w warfare. I'm, I'm not going to let the enemy intimidate me to stop or to quit. I'm going to keep declaring to it. I'm going to keep telling it. I'm like a command. I will command to it over and over, just believing that I have authentic and genuine power. So here's our follow-up questions. If our prayers... If our prayers do have an expansive and effective impact on circumstances, what happens if we don't pray? And I'm not talking about the kind of prayer where you're just throwing up a lottery number and hoping that it, it hits and you get the, the big windfall. I'm talking about where you are expecting that my prayers are executing spiritual law. My prayers are stepping into authority, inviting God into this earth realm, this fallen world to do what he's always wanted to do. And my human agency somehow gives God the legal right, not, not me, per se, but the legal right, the legality that is in God, in his own nature, in his own attributes, that God being legal, that God being just, that God only does righteous things, that God will not violate himself. And so God requires that we ask him, invite him in so that he can legally do what he wants to do without violating himself. I think that's a fascinating idea. And you've got to take the redemption workshop to understand that a little bit more. So, if our prayers do have an expansive and effective impact on our circumstances, what happens if we don't pray? What happens if we don't pray? If our evangelism does have an expansive and effective impact on eternal salvation of sinners, what happens if we don't evangelize? Think about it. Again, if, if we in our evangelism believe that it has an expansive and effective impact on people coming to faith in Christ, what happens if we don't evangelize? If our laying on of hands on the people for miracle healings does have an expansive and effectual impact on sick bodies, what happens if we don't lay hands on the sick? Think about that. If we've been given the name of Jesus to manage down the devil and demons, what happens if we don't use that name to destroy the works of the devil? See, all of this has life-altering implications, and all of this impacts your attachment to God and to each other. It really re rectifies and settles down who you are in your own identity. And so we're thinking about all of this spiritual authority. So what do we mean when we talk about spiritual authority? Here's a definition. Spiritual authority, in short, so this is the quick version, is the responsibility to rightfully govern and enforce justice. It is the responsibility to rightfully govern and enforce justice. So there's something that's right and there's something that's wrong. Authority is where we have responsibility to rightfully govern that and actually enforce it. Whatever is just, whatever is right. So now that's the short one, the responsibility to rightfully govern and enforce justice. But now let me give you a longer one. The longer one is a God-given endowment. This in the context of spiritual authority is a God-given endowment, a permanent provision and responsibility of jurisdiction to rightfully govern and enforce justice aligned with God's purposes. 
I'm going to say it again, even though it's in your workshop show notes. A God-given endowment, a permanent provision. In other words, it's not temporary. It doesn't come and then leave. It's not situational. It's not relative. It is a permanent provision and responsibility of jurisdiction to rightfully govern and enforce justice aligned with God's purposes. What are God's purposes? They are all revealed to us in the word. They are not random and they are not found exclusive in our circumstances. Most of our circumstances have become toxic and tainted. They've been colored by the enemy, the God of this world, Satan himself, and as a result, you cannot put confidence in your circumstances. They will screw you over and they will deceive you. So in short, I want you to catch this. If God delegated his rule on earth to his people and his people are delinquent to those responsibilities, think about this. If God delegated his rule on earth to his people and his people are delinquent to those responsibilities, how much pain and sorrow have we unduly endured and how much of our understanding of God has been skewed? Think about that. I'm going to read that again. If God delegated his rule on earth to his people and his people are delinquent to those responsibilities, how much pain and sorrow have we unduly endured and how much of our understanding of God has been skewed? You might be thinking, how could anybody, how could anybody question some of these things? Well, I don't believe anybody questions whether God has authority. I don't believe anybody has questions around whether Jesus has authority. I think the issue is, is do you have authority? Do believers have God-given authority to represent God in the earth? And so I want us to look at three different, real quick, three different views when it comes to God's sovereignty and human agency. What I mean by that is God's sovereignty would represent this arbitrary, predetermined outcome that's independent of mankind. Human agency would be that God has given this human agency divine grace to execute this responsibility, this jurisdiction. It's the permanent responsibility to enforce justice aligned with God's purposes. So when we talk about the human agency, we're talking about that. When we're talking about God's sovereignty, we're talking about that, that being the other side of that God has already predetermined it. Well, there's three different views that are general. Now, when I use terminology in these views, understand that the terminology is uh, such where uh, sometimes when you hear a label, uh, for instance, if you're ever put in a group and you're labeled that group, uh, you're like, well, wait a minute, I don't align with everything that's in that label or that group. I get all that. I get all that. But for clarity and simplicity of grouping ideas the best way we can, I believe that these three groups are the, the clearest representation of what people believe. So the first view of God's sovereignty or man's hum, uh, human agency uh, in terms of how God executes his kingdom and will in the earth the first one we want to talk about is the redemptionist view. Now, let me say, when I use the word redemptionist, I'm using it as a label that I have created to emphasize that the authority is based in redemption. The authority is based in redemption. Now, in church history, there's a group of redemptionists. I'm not necessarily talking about that group. I'm not using this term to align with some other uh, historical use or theological use. This is something that's very personal. It's something that I have designed as a label to exact upon when we got redeemed, we received spiritual authority. Now, the redemptionist view is the view that I have. The redemptionist view is the view that you will hear at LifePoint over and over and over. So this view is the view that in redemption, that Jesus already paid the price and in his death, burial, and resurrection, we have received spiritual authority. And that authority is now permanent. That authority is permanent. We have it. It's not something that we are getting and then losing. It's not something that's temporary. And it's not something that we are without because God, he carries the authority and he wants that authority to be independent of human agency. So a redemptionist view is where, in fact, the believer has been permanently endowed with spiritual authority. It is where Christ has done this in redemption and now we partner with God 
And that is always available. I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we can execute in God's kingdom. The second view, the second view is what we'll call the cessationist, the cessationist view. Now, that is a term that is common in Christian theology and in Christian history. A cessationist is somebody who, in essence, believes that all of the spiritual authority, all human agency administering God's kingdom in the earth, all the human agency, all of that stopped when the last apostle died that they were exclusively and specially endowed with spiritual authority. And then once the Bible showed up, the Bible was written, and once it was written, uh, put down, not, not published as we would think of publishing, but just written, put down, and then there was some distri uh, distribution of those letters and writings that at that point they believed that all of the divine responsibility and authority and endowment of power upon Christian believers, that all passed away. So the cessationist, and cessation means that it ceased, cessation ceased, that it all ceased when the last apostle died. A cessationist believes that God still does miracles, still does miracles, but those miracles are actually done independent of human agency, that God can do it randomly in the earth, but human agency is not involved. That God just simply shows up and does whatever his sovereign will is. Then the third view is what I'm calling charismatic sovereignist. Charismatic sovereignist. Again, this is a term that I have created. This isn't a term that necessarily is used in the theological circles, nor is it a term that is a historic term. Charismatic sovereignists would be somebody who, based on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's giftings, listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that these giftings are actually the, uh, the, the reason that a person would have a special, momentary, temporary spiritual authority. And that when that is available, when the Holy Spirit uniquely and specially and temporarily anoints somebody, that they will have the authority to, in that moment to represent the Father. It's not permanent. So you have the redemptionist view, which is that it's permanent because of redemption. And the Holy Spirit is always living and abiding in a believer and that you work with him and that you can step on faith and step on the word and, and uh, in activation of belief and you begin to operate in this miracle ability. That's the redemptionist view. The cessationist is, is that God works without human agency. And then the uh, charismatic sovereignist believes that God's sovereignty is still being used, but the sovereignty in an arbitrary way is worked through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, making that authority to be unique, special, and temporary. The difference between the charismatic sovereignist and the cessationist is, is purely on the basis of human agency. The cessationist says that God doesn't do anything in partnership with human agency, that God in his sovereignty just does whatever he's going to do miraculously, and he does it in randomness around uh, the, the entire universe. And then when you look at the charismatic sovereignist, they still believe in the sovereignty of God controlling the authority, but believes that human agency does get use, but it's only in temporary, special, and unique ways. The redemptionist, again, sets apart because we believe God's sovereignty was revealed in redemption, and that authority, the name of Jesus, the Word of God, everything that is of authority was given to us and established once and for all, and so today we can, in any situation, represent the kingdom of God, even if we don't feel it, even if there's not a quote-unquote gift of the Spirit, but if we'll operate in the authority of the Word, often gifts of the Holy Spirit will come and manifest in that moment as a back work, as a, uh, an activated work, rather than uh, something that precludes us operating in authority, which the charismatic sovereignist would typically say. So let's just for a few minutes walk through this. When we talk about the redemptionist view, I think you have some understanding of that. And certainly in the redemption workshop, if you haven't taken that, I encourage you to go back and take that because it will root down as to why this is such a secure and convicting foundation of our walk with God. The cessationist view 
Again, they believe that there is never any jurisdiction that God actually controls everything. The jurisdiction is never in human agency. And so if you follow their line of thought, I'll extrapolate it a little further here. They would believe that this authority was certainly given to Jesus. Jesus had the authority, and because he had it, he was able then to give it to the apostles. That authority then was given to one generation down to the apostles. And then the apostles could operate freely in that authority, but then they could also give it to an individual either temporarily or they could give it, but that person now, the next generation down, did not have the ability to give it to somebody else. So they believe that Jesus specifically gave authority, this is the cessationist, Jesus gave the authority to his first century apostles, and those apostles then could give it, but they couldn't now then uh, give uh, perpetuity to it, they couldn't cause it to continue in the downline, it had to stop with whoever they gave it to. So when the last apostle died, the authority Jesus gave the early church, what you read in the book of Acts, that all passed away when the last apostle died. When it comes to those miracles, if a person prays today for a miracle and they get healed, then that was just the sovereign control of God. And if they didn't, it was also in the cessationist view, also the will of God that they not be healed. And so the roots of this cessationist doctrine. So you might be wondering, where do they get all of this to actually interpret scripture? Where, where do they find this in the Bible? Well, what they believe is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you can see it uh, in your show notes, but it says in verse 8, and this is the text, charity never fails. And this is talking about love. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there be miracles or tongues, speaking in tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, verse 10 now, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. I want you to think about this text. And it says in that last phrase, verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. So when the cessationist reads this text, this text, they believe that that which is perfect is come is talking about the written Bible, that when the Bible was written, that that which is, that is that which is perfect. And when that came, all the other things that were in part were done away with. So that means the prophecies are now done. Speaking in tongues is now done. And, uh, and then knowledge would have to vanish away with it. And they, they again establish that it has to be the written word. And so now all of, all of these supernatural endowments and all these representations of God, uh, spiritual authority, ambassadorship in the way that we talk about it, all that was done away with. I, I want to say that when we as redemptionists read this text, so as I read this text, I believe that that which is perfect has come is actually talking about either the rapture of the church or the second coming of Jesus. The rapture of the church or the second coming of Jesus when Jesus ultimately is going to establish the millennial kingdom upon the earth. So when that which is perfect has come, I don't believe it's the written Bible. And here's why. When you look at verse 13, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 8, and he says, prophecies, they'll fail. So the question is, have prophecies failed? Have prophecies failed? Well, the cessationists would say yes. Well, Jesus, I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul in his own writing in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, this is the Apostle Paul who wrote this. And in fact, he writes in chapter 14, one chapter later, just a few verses later, he says this, that prophecies speak edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. That God would actually endow somebody to have this, I'm going to call it supernatural edification, exhortation, and comfort. The question is, is do we still have prophecy today? If you just think about it in a simple gift without all of this necessity to forecast what's going to happen tomorrow. Most people think of prophecy and they think of God giving a, a human being the ability to see tomorrow. Prophecy in its simple form is simply a medium of communication. And the communication is here said to carry the things of edification, exhortation, and comfort. It is a communication medium, prophecy is, to supernaturally comfort people. 
it can carry with it divine knowledge about things concerning the future. But prophecy itself is not the divine knowledge. That would be considered another gift of the Holy Spirit, the word of knowledge. This prophecy is simple in that it is simply a communication medium. So if, if prophecy is going to pass away when that which is perfect has come, we have to ask the question, today in church and in Christianity, is there divine Ability Is there a supernatural support? Is there an anointing of God to help people be edified, encouraged, and comfort? I say, I think it's crazy to believe otherwise. I absolutely believe that God encourages people. I believe that you and I both have been encouraged by somebody and we're being encouraged. It wasn't just natural. It was something that impacted us in a deep enlightenment kind of way. And yet it was very simple. It wasn't like there was any big wisdom in it. It was just we were encouraged in our, in our spirits, in our hearts, in our minds. So if prophecies haven't passed away, then that which is perfect couldn't have come yet. Then we move on further down and he says in that text that knowledge will vanish away. Knowledge will vanish away. So here's the question. Do we still have knowledge today? Or do we have revelation knowledge today? However you want to express it, do we have knowledge today? If we still have divine knowledge, revelation knowledge, if we still are understanding things, if we're growing in our understanding of God, if God is revealing himself to us through his word, through his word, I mean, we are getting his word, but we are receiving this divine knowledge. The fact that it's knowledge means that that which is perfect could not have come. Now, what's interesting is, is even if you don't agree with everything that I just said in interpreting this text, there are no other relevant. There are no other relevant scriptures to support the cessationist position. I'm just, I'm just being authentic about it. I'm not trying to uh, twist it, not trying to change it. I wish there was more. I have researched it. I've looked into the position, and I'm fascinated that I don't find any more. I, there are a couple of other verses. Uh, for instance, the, the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, and so they'll go on to say just with that phrase. They'll go on to say that, well, that shows you that apostles and prophets weren't needed anymore because they were only needed for a foundation. i got to be honest. That is some crazy biblical interpretation that you would take a statement like that the New Testament church— the church was built on apostles and prophets. And then from that, assume, because it's all pure assumption that apostles and prophets no longer exist today because simply that it says that the church was founded on it, it was the foundation of it. Again, there are no other relevant scriptures. Now, when we look at the charismatic sovereignist view, where does that position come from? How does that get rolling? Where did it start? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 it says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of uh, ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of uh, act activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one to profit with all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the selfsame spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So I want you to consider that last phrase, individually as he wills. So this text, in essence, is saying that the Holy Spirit expresses himself in nine ways. That in nine ways there are demonstrations or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. These are called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are three revelation gifts. There's the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. There are three power gifts. This is the gifts of healings, working of miracles, and the gift of faith. There are also three communication gifts or utterance gifts. These are the gifts of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. So when we look at this spiritual authority, when we look at how there is a, a deriving of 
this temporary, unique, and special authority that's giving, given to a believer to represent God, but it's only temporary and then it's gone. It comes from this text where, again, it says that they are distributed to everyone as he wills. So in this, they believe that if there is this kind of moment, this aura, this impression where I have a gift of the Holy Spirit, then I can activate that, but that authority is now then limited to the bookends. It starts with that anointing or that special gifting, and it stops with that special gifting. Unlike the redemptionist, it is not permanent. That all comes from that phrase at the end that says he distributes as he wills, as he wills. Well, my issue with stopping it as he wills is there is an interesting interpretation of that by the, the charismatic sovereignist to believe that because it says he's distributing it as he wills, that somehow we assume he doesn't will, but it doesn't say that he doesn't will. What if the Holy Spirit was always willing for all of his gifts of the Spirit to be in operation, but somehow we aren't uh, affluent or we are not uh, used to the personality of the Holy Spirit, the laws that govern these kinds of things, the, the way to relationally engage him or to operate with him. What if he's always willing to do things? There was a great minister that many people have high regard for. He's impacted my life dramatically. He lived and ministered, the height of his ministry was in the 40s and early 50s. And this guy's name is Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth, a man of phenomenal intimacy with God, phenomenal signs and wonders and miracles operated in the gift of special faith, the gift of special faith often. And he said, I will push my faith as far as it will go. And then God drops in me his faith. So let's kind of flip that and reinterpret it and say that he, he's describing, I will take my spiritual authority as far as I know how to go. I will press it as far as I can go. And then there is this extra endowment of spiritual authority. What I mean by that is that we have the authority as a redemptionist, and yet uh, we maybe don't fully understand how the Holy Spirit wants to work, and we don't know what he's willing to do. We don't know that he's already fully engaged, wants more for our lives than we could want ourselves. So keep in mind this. It's just an interesting thought. We'll get more into this in another workshop around the Holy Spirit. But God the Holy Spirit is not different than God the Father. We're talking about the Holy Trinity. So if God the Father has put healing and deliverance and freedom in redemption so that it's a permanent thing. If God the Father is moved with compassion to heal, if God wants people delivered, then the Holy Spirit would have to align perfectly with the heart of the Father. And that means that his will to do supernatural things has to be at a height, at a consistency, at a fervency like God the Father's. So I don't believe that the Holy Spirit's unwilling. I believe he's always willing. I just believe that we have often not known how to tap into such things. And so as we walk through each and every one of these, I want you to know that the redemptionist rebuttal of this is that, yes, in redemption, we have received the authority. Everything we believe is rooted in authority. The authority we've been given, we believe we've been given the word of God, that's authority. We've been given the name of Jesus, that's authority. And nobody would ever look at the word of God and say, well, the word of God, what it tells you, that is real, that's authoritative, temporarily, uniquely, and specially. No, everybody who is a Christian would read the Bible and say that is available to every believer anytime, all the time. It is permanent. Well, if the word of God is authority and the Bible in the Old Testament says God sent his word, Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them. The word is the authority. So again, if we're going to keep apples with apples, oranges with oranges, we have to believe that that authority has been given to us in a permanent form and we've been given the anointing of the Holy Spirit he is abiding in us, and he always wills. Well, let me wrap this workshop session up. If you allow yourself to shape your doctrine from your experience, that you are allowing yourself to have a bias as you move into interpretation of Scripture, and you've already determined the outcome of the interpretation, and as a result, you are now then uh, beginning the process of research trying to prove your point, you're going to wind up being skewed and really in an insecure attachment to God. 
<clears throat> God does not want us to approach him as though, in fact, that he is somehow holding out on us or causing the human suffering that particularly is in this fallen world. Again, we don't want to reestablish confirmation bias. And again, that would be where we are looking to research for an end interpretation we have in mind. This uh, workshop semester, <clears throat> let me encourage you. <clears throat> we would like everybody to engage this full workshop. I believe that if you understand redemption, spiritual authority, and the Holy Spirit, we lay out a great foundation for each one in three different workshops. If you understand those, you will understand 85 to 100% of everything you need to understand to to satisfy a secure heart before God where all human suffering is concerned in any biblical text that has challenged you. Now, the cessationists, let me say, often will take all the things I just taught you today and they'll say, well, spiritual authority is nowhere in the Bible. There is no grounds to believe that a Christian actually possesses the authority to enforce jurisdiction. There is nothing in the Bible that gives that direct communication. I just want to say everything we just read today, is there one moment, one moment that I've twisted scripture? And the answer is no, there's not one moment. And so when I hear people who seem like they're authorities and they speak with a lot of conviction and they say, the only way you can believe that is by twisting scripture. It's like, wait, wait, that's fun for you to say, but it's not true. It's not true. I didn't twist anything. There's no magic. I hadn't pulled any rabbits out of hats. There's nothing skewed here. I gave it to you clean cut and in reality. So I just encourage you today as we move through this workshop, you get locked and loaded because you're going to be operating in spiritual authority and therefore you're going to have new outcomes. You're going to have new fruitfulness. You're going to have new blessings in your life and your love with God because now you are in an adventure with God where you're not just simply uh, the subject or the victim of whatever happens that this fallen world tells you is God. This is a big, big deal. God bless you guys. See you next session.